Our studies over the next week, God willing, are going to concentrate upon the wilderness generation, but especially as they approach the land of promise. We're going to start with Caleb because Caleb is there on the first approach after two years out of Egypt, and he's there on the last approach, and he's there on the seventh year of conquest. At the age of 85, Caleb is still there, part of the picture. Like us, the Israelites were nearing the end of a long pilgrimage in the wilderness. They were on the edge of inheriting Abraham's land. And they were to come twice, right to the edge of the promised land. On the first occasion, they were sent away to wander for 38 years of hopeless wandering in that wilderness, that waste howling wilderness. And in that 38 years, approximately one and a half million of them lost their mortal lives and their future inheritance. God has sworn, they shall not enter into my rest, both now and in the future. And that is an enormous tragedy, brethren and sisters, for that generation that came out of Egypt. We left in no doubt that these lessons are very applicable to us. It says in verse 11 and 12 of the chapter we just read, Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, for types, for figures, as the margin says in verse 6. These things have been specifically recorded that we might learn the lessons that are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the ages are come. And we need to discern why it is the Bible puts so much recording of this period of Israel's history into the Holy Scriptures. Why it's commented upon by the Apostle Paul. Why it's so applicable to us. In verse 1 and in verse 11, Paul says we need to take the warning. In verse 1 he says, I would not that you should be ignorant. We are not ignorant of the storyline of Israel in the wilderness. But we can be ignorant and unheeding of the warnings. As verse 12 says to us, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth Take heed, lest he fall. And the word therefore thinketh means to have an opinion about yourself. And we can think that we're okay. We can think that we're fine. We would not fall as they did. But God is saying through Paul, it's quite likely that we could. But how different were they to us? They lived in tents. We experienced that perhaps for a week a year when we come up here to watch and lake. You try living that tent for 38 years. They had few possessions, only what they could carry. It was a waste, howling wilderness with sandstorms. They ate manna day after day. They fought with swords and spears. How does their experience really relate to us? We have comforts, we have homes full of stuff. We're very high tech these days. We have an abundance of food, air conditioning. So how do they relate to us? Well, there are two ways, very clear ways that they relate to us. Firstly, they were the ecclesia in the wilderness. That's what Stephen calls them in Acts 7 verse 38. They were the ecclesia in the wilderness. They were called out of darkness. They were baptised in the Red Sea. They began a journey toward the kingdom. And the wilderness was their trial of faith, their hardships, their deprivation, their testing ground. They were attacked by the Amalekites, who picked off those who fell behind the ecclesia. They suffered hunger and thirst on a number of occasions. And from within, they were troubled by the mixed multitude. The faithless, who often became restless, the murmurers. You see, it was not easy in the wilderness, was it? They had to learn to march in rank and to walk together. And all the 12 tribes with their various individuals and their various leadership having to cooperate for the good of all. And we are the ecclesia of the 21st century. How do we compare? Every ecclesia, like the tribes, contain very different individuals. In our brotherhood, we have many different ecclesias with very varying characteristics. And we have to learn to march in rank as a united body, as those tribes had to. And there are problems and tensions that arise between the tribes. And we're going to see some of those in this series. 
and there are individuals that rise up and bring trouble into our midst. People like Korah, a man full of pride and envy, promoting themselves and doing so by tearing down the, those that God has chosen to lead, twisting God's words out of shape. And today, brethren and sisters, the wilderness that we walk in is not sand and heat and scorpions. It's actually more dangerous. It's a desert of divine principle. A desert devoid of righteousness. We are surrounded by godless thinking. A desert with no sound morals and values. And we hunger and thirst after righteousness. We are frustrated by a world that preaches liberty to every corrupt practice. And around us there are Amalekites. Amalekites like Richard Dawkins. The new atheists who are very efficiently cutting off those who fail to keep in step with the ecclesia. We might not be confronted by swords in open battle, but we have the much more subtle invasion of the totally uncensored internet, where every heretic, every disenchanted Christadelphian can cleverly undermine the faith of our brethren and sisters and young people. And the closer we get to the promised land, the more we are faced with grossly specific and accessible sexual depravity that would make the Canaanites blush. Our wilderness may look different to sand and scorpions, but it's much more subtle and it's much more private. It's much more sophisticated to access. And the dangers of our wilderness are harder to perceive as to what it's doing to us. So we are an ecclesia in the wilderness, brethren and sisters and young people. The second connection is very obvious as to why their experience relates to us, and that is that human nature does not change. It says there in verse 13, There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men. Murmuring, lust after evil things, idolatry, fornication occur in all generations. The format of the temptations may change, but the way that the flesh responds has never changed. And the closer we get to the land, the stronger the opportunities become as the iniquity of the Amorites comes to its fullness to be destroyed by Christ. And we ignore the warnings here at our peril. Now I want you to think about the privileges they had. You know, it says all these things happen under them for types. Spiritual privilege, they all experience. And you should colour in the word all between verse 1 and verse 4. Five times it says they all had this, they all had that, they all had this. They were protected by the cloud and the angel of God's presence was with them, says Isaiah 63. They passed through the Red Sea, rescued by God. They were baptised into Moses and became a kingdom of priests. They received the manna every day. They drank water from the rock and had the opportunity, were they spiritually minded enough, to discern that that rock was the Messiah. Look what verse 4 says. They drank of the spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. If you ever ask yourself, what is a spiritual rock? You see, it's a rock that teaches lessons for the mind. And most Israelites looked at that rock and said, isn't that wonderful that water comes out of that rock? But the discerning Israelite would say, what is that teaching me? Because the first time it happened, an angel stood on the rock and it was the Yahweh angel, God's personal representative. The one that God would send into the earth to represent himself stood on that rock. And Paul says, that rock was Christ. There was, for the discerning, the evidence that God had a greater plan than just feeding people in the wilderness. And you see, God loves people who are discerning, who ask questions, who pursue to understand. My favourite quote from Brother Thomas is, the deity delights in stimulating the intellect of his creatures. From Phanerosis, page 38. The deity delights in stimulating the intellect of his creatures. And that's exactly what God did by putting that angel on the rock. And some of them understood that. 
They could perceive the symbols that were there. The benefits they had are very obvious. God had destroyed Egypt. He destroyed their land and their produce and their herds, their firstborn, their army, their king, all for the sakes of the Jews. They were baptised and they saw on the shore the bodies of the Egyptians, symbolising the life they had left behind them. They were made God's chosen people at Sinai, a kingdom of priests. God provided the daily bread of life. Their clothes never wore out. They saw many miracles performed. Water, food, quails, fiery clouds, miracles day by day. I want you to come to Exodus chapter 17. I want to talk about this miracle. Just keep a a marker there and go to Exodus chapter 17. You know, they were given God's law, the divine revelation of of the purpose and the mind of God. They had divine protection. The angel of God's presence shepherded them, says Isaiah 63. But let's just go to Exodus chapter 17. I want to just explore this idea about the rock that followed them. If you've got your hands still in Corinthians, you'll see it says in the margin, the rock that went with them. And that's quite specific. And Paul is giving us a detail that's not always obvious when you go to Exodus. The rock went with them. Now, I don't think that every morning they got up, there was that the rock had actually come on the journey. What that's saying was, when we go to Exodus 17, let's just follow the story here briefly. In verse 5 and 6, they've been complaining about nothing to drink. Yahweh said to Moses, go on before the people. Now, they're they're camped at Rephidim in verse 1. Just note that point. In chapter 19, verse 2, they're still at Rephidim. They didn't leave until 19, verse 2. So the bulk of the camp was at Rephidim when this miracle happens. So God said to Moses, go on before the people. Take your rod where you smote the river and go. Behold, I, says God, my personal representative, I will stand there before upon the rock in Horeb and you shall smite the rock and shall come out water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he went to a place called Massa and Meribah. When he got back to Rephidim, the battle with Amalek was underway. But you see, Rephidim and where the water was struck at Horeb are about 40 miles apart. So Moses went on before the, the camp, 40 miles away, to where the angel stood on the rock in Horeb struck the rock and the water flowed all the way back to the camp of Israel at Rephidim. Now that miracle was not duplicated until Numbers 21 at the end of the 40 years. And then of course Moses should have spoken to the rock and failed to uphold the type by smiting the rock on the second occasion. So there was never another occasion where he went and smote the rock. It was smitten once. You can't crucify the Son of God afresh. So what an amazing miracle that was. You know, Paul says, explaining it to us, he says, the water went with them. It followed them. And you think about that. Whenever the cloud moved the camp from one place to another, they would begin to set up camp and the water would suddenly arrive because they needed running water for their washing and their ceremonies and their sacrifices. So the water would suddenly arrive. It followed them wherever they were taken by the direction of the angel. What an amazing miracle that was. All I had to do was to seek the source of the miracle in faith, to think about the God that did that, to think about why the angel stood on the rock and why you had to smite the rock. You see, Paul said the discerning could work out that that rock was Christ. And here we are, brethren and sisters, rescued by the blood of the Passover lamb, baptised into Christ, rescued from slavery, protected and guided by the angels, promised an inheritance with Abraham in the land, called to be a kingdom of priests, provided daily manna, and the water of life is freely available. You know, our chairman reminded us this morning of the privilege we have in this country and countries like it, where we can freely open the Bible that is in our hands. That's not always been the case. It's not the case in some parts of the brotherhood today. 
where people have to meet in secret. We have all the privileges. We have the water on our laps. Are we any better than them, brethren and sisters? We'll come back to the first of Corinthians. That's just a map of, of where Rephidim and Sinai is. But come back to the first of Corinthians chapter 10. Let's see what else Paul says that we can learn from. First Corinthians chapter 10. Let's just pick the record up in verse 5. You know, all of them had those privileges and we all have privileges in Christ. But it says in verse 5, reading from Rotherham, but with most of them, same with the diaglot, with most of them, it should be. God was not well pleased. And they became a catastrophe. You probably know the word there for overthrown is the Greek word catastrophe. They became a catastrophe in the wilderness. It was a disaster, brethren and sisters. Why? Well, in verse 6, they lusted after evil things. They lusted after the delicacies of Egypt. Give us flesh to eat. Oh, the melons and the garlics that they had in Egypt. Thinking back to the past. In verse 7, they were idolaters. They made the gods of Egypt all over again in the golden calf, demanding license to express the flesh. They were fornicators. The very first opportunity when the daughters of Moab came in Numbers 25, 23,000 people died in the plague and 1,000 were, were, were crucified. They tempted God. They despised the manna. They doubted God's power time after time. They doubted God's intentions. God has brought us out here to kill us, they said. They tempted God with the things that they said. And they murmured ten times, slandering God's land, blaming God and Moses. And one thing clearly comes out from the way God talks about Israel is that God despises a negative spirit, a murmuring spirit. And so in verse 5, they became a catastrophe. Within two years, the whole generation, apart from Joshua, Caleb and a few Levites, they were all gone. It's estimated that from the time that they were condemned in Numbers 14 until the time that they came to the brook Zered where the last murmurer died, the average funerals per day was 500. Probably the majority of those occurred towards the end of the time. There would have been thousands of funerals in the last few years as they approached the land. What a list of failures, brethren and sisters. But Paul says, don't be high-minded. We can also lust after Egypt's and Canaan's delicacies. It's an age of indulgence, an age of selfishness. Temptation is so accessible today. We can make idols of our career our money, our sport, our homes, of the fun culture, of social media and technology. You know, recently Lynn and I took a five-hour train trip between Montreal and Toronto. We looked around the carriage and we noticed that, except for ourselves, almost every other person was on some form of electronic device. If somebody had come from 100 years ago, they would have thought it was incredible that people were so, so tuned into these little gadgets on their laps. And that's how the world has trained us. That perhaps is the modern golden calf, isn't it? You try going to the restaurant and see how many people can actually eat the meal without getting their phone out. You know, the technology deprivation just eats them out. And then, of course, there's a thing called gaming addictions. I mention that because... In the small ecclesia we come from, we've lost two brethren to gaming addition, addictions. But they not only spent most of their money, they connected with people who were also playing the games and left their families. Gaming addictions, where they sat up all night and lost their jobs because they were so addicted to this gaming. You know, that's the modern day idolatry, isn't it? Neither you be idolaters as some of them were. Whatever takes your attention, whatever takes your time, whatever absorbs your interest, whatever you can't leave alone is idolatry. Think about it the next time when you're missing your phone, how much you can't seem to do without it. Have we been hooked into that technology? As useful as it is, it has to become a tool and not a master. 
Murmuring, negative grumbling, accusations, imputing motive. We'll talk more about that when we come to Korah. There were ten issues that they were murmuring over. Water, food, water, jealousy, the fear of the spies' report, Korah's rebellion, bitterness, jealousy over the Levites, water and for food. Always targeted at Moses, he got the blame. And yet we know that God says he hates murmurers. Verse 10, neither murmur ye as some of them murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. And God left those murmurers to rot in the wilderness. God loathes base ingratitude, jealousy, envy and complaining. You know, you learn in life it is so easy to find fault, to pick holes, to take the opposite viewpoint. The media and their politicians are extremely good at it. doesn't matter what one party says, the other party will find that it's hopeless and oppose it all the way. It is always possible to put an alternative view. But the Spirit of Christ is cooperation, encouragement, inspiration, peacemaking. So different to the spirit of the flesh. And just in case... We thought we might be immune. We have verse 12 and verse 13. Written for the last generation, upon whom the ends of the age are come. These records are so important for us because human nature has not changed. But I want you to notice verse 13. This perhaps is one of the most misapplied verses in our community. So often you hear it quoted as a matter of comfort to console people in distress and sadness and going through trials. The sentiment that God comforts mourners is true. But that's not what this verse is talking about. Because there are some trials and there are many sufferings that are not going to be relieved this side of the kingdom. You can't use verse 13 to somebody who's clearly dying of cancer. Some situations are unresolvable before the Lord returns. There is no escape from some depressing circumstances that come upon us. The verse is about temptation, not about suffering. It's how we avoid getting trapped by the world. And whatever guy's temptation comes in, it will arouse the same human lust that the Israelites had to deal with common to men and God's reminding us in verse 13 there is no temptation that has never been experienced before it might come in a different package but it's appealing to the same basic lusts but there is no temptation that's impossible to resist and God will provide a way for us to get away from temptation there is a way of escape but it's usually removing yourself from it You know, Jesus talked about cutting out your eye and cutting off your hand. Sometimes it's severe action that has to be taken. Remember Joseph leaving his coat in the hands of his enemy? Left, fled out. Three times it says it in that record. He left his coat and he fled and he got out because he knew he couldn't stay there. He knew he was flesh. And there is always a way to get out. It might be embarrassing. It might cost you your job. It might cost you your friends. But you have to get away from temptation. And God says, flee from idolatry in verse 13, verse 14. In Corinthians, he says, chapter 6 and verse 18, flee from fornication, which is surely based upon Joseph. And so the record is there. These are written for the last generation. There is a way of escape. Now, 1 Corinthians 10 is not a prophecy. It's not saying it will happen. What it's saying is it's a distinct possibility. I find it so sad that we seem to be hearing in these last days, at this last hour, about so many that are falling away from the faith they once believed. So let's look at the lessons that we take from the ecclesia in the wilderness. They lost a whole generation. They lost 50,000 right beside the River Jordan in the last hurdle. 
We want to look at good people and bad people around that time. So we're going to talk today about the attitude we can adopt. The generation that saw the plagues, the Red Sea, were condemned after just two years. Their bones were strewn in the wilderness. I want you to come to Numbers chapter 13. Let's go back to the well-known record of the 12 spies. And all I want to do is to talk about the difference in perceptions between Caleb and the others. So in Numbers 13, let's pick up the record of what happened when those 12 spies reported back. Now, as you probably know, it was initially not God's decision to search the land. Deuteronomy 1.22, Moses tells us that Israel said, we will send men. In other words, they didn't particularly trust what God had told them about a land flowing with milk and honey. They wanted proof for themselves. So as God often does, he says, well, if that's what you want, I will regulate the process and tell you how it will be done, which is what happens here in Numbers 13. Yahweh comes in and says, well, because they've asked, this is how you're going to do it. And God controlled the process. So there was already an insult to God in that. We should take God at his word and not doubt or question him. And for a very good reason. It is not good to know ahead of time all the battles and trials between us and the kingdom. For many of us, brethren and sisters, had we known the hills and the valleys of life that we've traversed, had we known the heartbreak and the struggle, we may not have bothered to start at all. In verse 21 of chapter 13, it says, They went up and searched the land, and they found it exactly as God had said. Verse 27, we came to the land whither you sent us, and surely it does flow with milk and honey, and this is the fruit of it. And what a contrast it was to the waste howling wilderness, a land of hills and valleys and streams that drinketh the rain of heaven, a land of forests. It was all theirs for the taking, vineyards and, and fields planted, cities built. And we can be sure that the kingdom will not disappoint us, brethren and sisters, in fact, it will contain far more than we can anticipate. And so they saw the land was exactly and better than God had actually told them. It is not wise to know all the trials between you and the kingdom. But they saw more than just the land. They also saw the barriers to getting into it. Now, if you've got a coloured pencil, I'd love you to have one with you because I really believe in colouring exercises. I want you to colour in the word saw and sight. You'll find it there in verse 20, 28. We saw the children of Anak. In verse 32, we saw men of great stature. We saw the giants. We were in our sight as grasshoppers and in their sight, likewise, they saw us as grasshoppers. So we have a generation here amongst the ten spies that saw differently to what Joshua and Caleb saw. And we're going to talk about perceptions relating to Hebron. Now, there's a little interesting detail in verse 22. It says in there, they came from the south, they came to Hebron. And it says there, Hebron was built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. Now, why do we need to know that? What on earth relevance has that got? He could have said 25 cities in Egypt. But he picked that one. I'll let you think about that one. I've got a little bit of a theory about it. But why is that mentioned there? We're also told in Joshua when Caleb claimed his inheritance that Joshua says you can have the territory you walked upon, which of course is Abrahamic in its tone. It's quite likely the spies actually divided up and went to different parts of the land, but they all agreed to meet at Hebron because they all saw Hebron. They all saw the giants. It may have been that Caleb went no further than Hebron. Whatever, I want you to notice the difference in perception of Hebron. You see, we can treat the barriers between us and the kingdom as either problems or opportunities. Let's take the problem viewpoint first. You know, it says in verse 32, they brought up an evil report upon the land. 
an evil report upon the land. And all they could talk about was giants. Where in their report, from verse 32 or verse 31 to 33, where in that report do you see any mention of Yahweh? Any mention of what God has done in the past? Any mention of the Red Sea opening up? Any mention of Mount Sinai quaking? Any mention of the manna, the fiery column that they saw every night? It's all about what they saw. What a difference between that seeing and the eye of faith. They said, we be not able to go up. We be not able. Was God asking them to do it on their own? He'd brought them through the Red Sea. He defeated Amalek for them. We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than us. What about God? You see, there's no eye of faith here, but there's plenty of eyes looking at the problems that lay between them and the land. You know, when you go to chapter 14, look what God says in verse 31. They despised my land. In verse 36, God says, they brought a slander upon my land. And back in chapter 13 and verse 32, we have a gross exaggeration. It's a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. This land eats people. Look at the contrast right across the page. Chapter 14, verse 9. Caleb said, they're dinner for us. We'll eat them up like bread. You know, what a contrast in attitude between two people. They said, this land eats people. Why would they say that? Because of the giants. The giants had them totally and utterly flummoxed. And they said, Caleb said, we can eat them. They're a meal for us because God will be with us. Their defence is departed from them. Yahweh's with us. Why are you afraid of them? And you see, there's the difference in perception. So the negative influence was only see the problems. Focus on the giants and their confidence was shattered. Now look at the difference with Caleb. This is what Joshua and Caleb saw when they got to Hebron. Verse 7, a very good land in chapter 14, verse 7. That's an exceeding good land. Rotherham has a very, very good land. It was the place that some of the promises were made to Abraham. Hebron. They were standing on the graves of Abraham, of Isaac and Jacob and their wives at Hebron, the cave of Machpelah, who died in faith not having inherited the promises. It was the place where Abraham organised a bunch of shepherds to go and take on four armies that had invaded the land and taken his brother Lot captive. That was the very place that 318 shepherds took on four armies and won, fighting with picks and shovels. The place where Abraham began to include the Gentiles in the promises, owners of a covenant, were the men of memory. And one of those men was called Eshkol, a cluster of grapes, divine fruitfulness. And where did they come in verse 23? They came to the brook of Eshkol, named after that man who was confederate with Abraham. And Caleb, who was a Gentile dog, which is what his name means, he stands up there and says, this is the place where Abraham became the father of many nations. Eshkol, fruitfulness. And it was the place where, they was, where Abraham was standing when God said, all of these nations you see around about you, I'm giving you their land. And he named them one by one. The Amalekites in verse 29, the Hittites of chapter 13, verse 29, the Jebusites, the Amorites, they are the lists of the people that God said to Abraham, I will give you their land. How differently did people see Hebron? You see, we can choose to see the same situation in two different ways. Caleb saw the giants as bread for us. The ten said the land eats people. No wonder Caleb demanded Hebron from Joshua in Joshua 14. Give me this mountain, he says. Give me those giants. I will prove that what I said is true. 
And so we come to chapter 14. Perhaps the saddest chapter in the Bible, the condemnation eternally of about one and a half million people. And we have to learn the danger, brethren and sisters, of murmuring and complaining. Murmuring and bitterness are contagious poison. Discouragement is an infectious disease. To put a negative spin is so easy. It appeals to the worst of human nature. Oh, the AB. You know, I know why they're doing this. They want to control us. You know, and that's murmuring, isn't it? You ever heard that sort of talk in your ecclesia? Implying of motives of why serving brethren do things? Well, look at chapter 14 and verse 1 and 2. The people lifted up their voice and they wept through the night. You imagine a camp of two million people crying their eyes out and howling from the tents. In the next day, they're murmuring against Aaron and Moses. They end up wanting to stone Joshua and Caleb. You know, that's the tragedy, isn't it? Well, let's just take some lessons from Caleb. Who was he? You know, Caleb was a descendant of Kenaz, the family of Esau. So he was a Gentile. His name means a dog. He was a converted Gentile. He was to become a leader in the tribe of Judah. He was the chosen spy from that particular tribe. And Judah excelled in incorporating Gentiles into their midst. You think about what Judah did. They took in Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabites, the sons of Hobab, the Kenite. They took in the family of the Kenites. They took in Itai the Gittite. And a few others we can trace as well. Judah was exceptional in including Gentiles. And Caleb is always linked in the record with Joshua. Fascinating fact. Every time God speaks of the two of them, God mentions Caleb first. When Moses writes about what they did, he puts Joshua first. But when God speaks directly about them, he puts Caleb first on every occasion. And he's called by God, my servant Caleb. Look at it in verse 24 of Numbers. But my servant Caleb, says God. And that puts him in a very, very exalted league indeed. There are only nine others beside the Lord Jesus Christ who God directly calls his servant. And here they are. Abraham, Job, Moses, Joshua, David, Isaiah, Eliakim, Zerubbabel. Caleb, Jesus Christ. All of those, except Christ, were given the title after they were dead, like Joshua. But Caleb got this title, this exalted designation, publicly ascribed while he was alive. Caleb, my servant, says God. So what a man he was. Well, look at Caleb's qualities. God says he had another spirit. In verse 24, he had a different spirit, a different perception. And he's followed me fully. And so he lived. Verse 38 says, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were the men that went to such land, they lived. Verse 37, the rest died. But these men lived. And you can go through this record, and it's worth colouring in chapter 14, the word died and lived. The faithless spies died. The nation died. You get words like they fall, carcasses, consumed, die, strewn along. They won't even be raised for judgment. No way, says God. They shall not enter my rest. But Caleb lived because he had a different perception. He saw things differently. So let's go to Joshua chapter 14 and look at the end of the story. Seven years after they crossed the River Jordan, the land is being divided up. Forty-five years waiting for Caleb. Thirty-eight in the wilderness, seven years of conquest. He's now 85 years old. Most of us looking for a comfortable armchair. Not Caleb. Look what he says. Verse 8. Coming to Joshua, he says, My brethren that went up with me, they made the hearts of the people melt. But I wholly followed Yahweh my God. 
Same thing in verse 9. He repeats the words of Moses. Thou hast wholly followed Yahweh my God. And he says, I'm now 85 at the end of verse 10. I'm strong this day as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, so is my strength now. Verse 12. Now therefore give me this mountain. He had been promised that where his feet had trodden, in verse 9, he would inherit. Give me this mountain. Well, he, gave, he got the mountain and he cleaned out the sons of Anak. He cleaned out the giants. You imagine what, how much the giants would have laughed when an 85-year-old turns up. But they were soon dead. You know, he demonstrates the same zeal and determination. His daughter does the same. You can read about the daughter of Caleb. She also demonstrates the same faith as her father. You know, Ecclesiastes 9 verse 4 says, A living dog, a living Caleb, is better than a dead lion. All the men of Judah, all the men of Judah had died except Caleb. A living dog is better than a dead lion. Caleb alone lived of the whole of the tribe of Judah over the age of 20 years. So Caleb was an idealist. Look what the Bible says about him. He wholly followed me. Fulfilled to go after me, says God. That's God's words. He fulfilled to go after me. I want to talk about people who are idealists in the truth. I'm going to give you an example of somebody you probably know, some of you. In Adelaide, we had for many years hired various camps for our young people's weekends and ecclesial camps, but they became fewer and fewer available to us. The opportunity to buy the Hebron campsite came up. And many people thought the ecclesias could not own property together. We could not really cooperate well enough to make it happen, to raise the money and to keep a campsite going as a combined ecclesial thing. Brother Brian Luke, along with a number of other brethren, determined that we should proceed against all the negative comment we had and push the matter through. We've just had our 700th camp at that site. We've just saved the Brotherhood $5 million, that most of which was going to other churches to hire their campsites. You see, that's vision. That's idealism. But we didn't realise at the time that it wasn't just a campsite. We proved to ourselves that we could cooperate as a group of ecclesias. And six years later, we opened a school. The first Christadelphian school in the Brotherhood. Because we'd learnt that we can work together and brethren working together on the site were drawn to understand and appreciate each other rather than stay in the silos of their ecclesias. It's been a great blessing, the camp, but the unity of the brotherhood that's come from it has been the most remarkable thing. You see, that's a man of vision. And we need those sort of people. These are the Caleb spirits, wholly following Yahweh. He said to the brethren, let us go up at once and possess it. We are well able to overcome it. And God says he's got a different perception. He looks at Hebron and doesn't see giants. He sees Abraham's inheritance. He will live. So what voice or attitude do you bring to your ecclesia? Is it the voice of Caleb that says, brethren, we can do it because God will work with us? Or is it the voice of negativity which says, We'd never get away with that. No, we can't do that. It wouldn't work. How often do complainers want to stone the arranging brethren? We are so good at finding reasons to doubt, to impute motives. Let's have more of the encouraging spirit of Caleb and God will bring us into the exceeding good land and Yahweh is with us. You know, you could summarise the attitude of Caleb in the words of the New Testament. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing is impossible. Mighty threw God to the pulling down of strongholds. And he pulled down a few of those, particularly at Hebron. Until they talked about the great and the world cities, well, down they came. If God be for us, who can be against us? Is anything too hard for Yahweh? We look not at the things which are seen, 
You see, that was the trouble with the ten spies. They saw the giants. Caleb saw Abraham's land. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. If Yahweh delight in us, he will bring us into the land to give it to us. Let us go up at once, for we are well able to overcome it. So there's the spirit of Caleb, a different perception. We must have that positive idealism, brethren and sisters. But I want to finish with a little exhortation from Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 1. You know, there's something quite remarkable about the way the Bible is written. You know, Moses reflects upon this in Deuteronomy 1 verse 27. And you murmured in your hearts. Now, before he died, Moses wrote down the history of their wanderings. And you said, because Yahweh hated us. That's Numbers 14 verse 1 to 4. That's tempting God. That's throwing God's words in his face. God says, I have loved you. They said he's hated us. Verse 28, whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our heart. The people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven and we've seen the sons of Anak. So Moses' commentary is exactly the same as we read in Numbers 13. They had looked at the problems and not the opportunities. So what does Moses now do? This is... 38 years later. He's got a whole new generation. There were only children or were born in the wilderness. And they are now facing the same giants, the same walled up cities. And they're standing on the edge of the land, about to cross the River Jordan. What can Moses do to encourage them to have a different perception? Well, look what he does. Come to chapter 2. And we have in chapter 2 and 3 of, of the book of Deuteronomy a history lesson. And it's rather unusual, if you haven't noticed it before. But look what he says. Let's go down to verse 10. And he's talking about they've gone through the land of Edom, they've gone through the land of Moab, and of course, being relatives of Abraham, they were not, they were not allowed to attack those people. But then he says in verse 10, he says, But, this is recounting the history of the land of Moab. Now, talk, we're talking about the land of Moab before they arrived. Why were the Moabites there? Well, the Emims dwelt therein in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. So the land of Moab was originally owned by giants called Emims, which were accounted giants as the Anakims. The Moabites called them Emims. The Horams also dwelt in Seir, that is in the territory of Edom. But the children of Israel succeeded them. If you've got a coloured pencil, colour in the word succeeded them took over, which is what it means, inherited their land. Look at the margin, inherited their land and dwelt in their stead as, the children, as Israel did to the land of his possession, which Yahweh gave unto them. So he says, look, you're going through the land of the Edomites and the Moabites. Both those nations, to get the inheritance they have, evicted giants. Then he comes down to, verse, to the Ammonites in verse 19. That land, he says, in verse 20, was also accounted a land of giants. Giants dwell there in old time, and the Ammonites called them Zamzamans. So this race of giants was spread right across the Middle East, and the Ammonites had got rid of them. A people great and tall as the Anakims, and Yahweh destroyed them. So God wanted the Ammonites to inherit that land. He got rid of those giants, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. As he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir, when he destroyed the Horums from before them, they succeeded them. They took over their inheritance and they dwell there to this day. So the Ammonites, the Moabites and the Edomites all got rid of giants because Yahweh wanted them to have that land. Verse 23, the Avams dwelt at Hazarim, even unto Astor, the Kaphtarim. So this is the land of the Philistines. They came out of Kaphtor and they destroyed them and dwelt in their steads. Now we know that the Philistines, of course, is where the giants of Gath came from. They were the remnant of the giants that the Philistines threw out to, to inherit their land. And so he says in verse 24, if God can give land to the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites and the Philistines and get rid of giants, rise up and take your journey. Pass over the river. I've given your hand and you've already defeated two big guys, Sihon and Og. Verse 
you know, Og was so big, his bed was, was enormous. You've already defeated giants, he says. Why would you be worried about the sons of Anak at Hebron? And you can see that Moses is giving them a lesson, isn't he? A history lesson of the fact that if God wants you to have the land, giants can be removed easily by God. If Gentile nations not in the covenant can do it with God's help, Israel, you can do it. So in chapter 3, he says, remember what happened to Og in verse 1. He came out. Verse 4, we took his cities at that time. In verse 6, we utterly destroyed him. In verse 8, we took at that time the land of the two kings of the Amorites. We took their land on this side of Jordan. In verse 11, Og was the only one that remained of the giants. And we killed him. And so the history lesson goes on. And you can trace that story right through. If God wants you to have the land, and if you work with God, you will get that land. And Rahab said to the spies, We have heard of the terrible things that you have done on the east of Jordan and in Egypt. And the terror of the land is fallen upon us. And God was going before them to give the land to his chosen people. And so, brethren and sisters, it's all a matter of perception, problem or opportunity. And there are giants that stand between us and our inheritance with Abraham. We face three giants, as Caleb faced the three sons of Anak. And our giants are the three human lusts. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We also face the three unclean spirits that bring madness into our world. But they can all be overcome because others have inherited with Abraham. Because people like Caleb showed us the way of wholly following Yahweh, of having a different spirit. Let us, brethren and sisters, take the advice of the Apostle Paul. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Providing, as Rotherham says, providing we look not to the things that are seen. We don't focus on the giants but to the things that are unseen, to the promises made to Abraham. For the things that are seen are transient. The things that are unseen are eternal.